Thank you everyone for rejoining us after lunch uh, in Monaco and around the rest of the world. So next up, I'm pleased to introduce Sampo Heitinen, CEO of Mass Global. Wake after that one, but let's see how much I have to dance to, to make that happen. Um, I come from a company called Mass Global. We are the company behind a concept that you might or may or may not have heard called mobility as a service. Um, it is a concept that's been the lips of just about everyone in the industry and also in the media. And it's quite strange to see that, you know, you come up with a com completely new concept and uh, when we're three people in the company, The Economist will write a four-page piece of you how you will change the whole world within the, in, within the mobility. But there's a reason to it. When you think of what we are doing, think of... Uh, Think of a disruption that are, is ongoing. Uh, in a way, you can even say there's a tsunami of digitalization that is ongoing in mobility. And we represent not how it looks as from the tech perspective, from the perspective of the industry, from the cities. We re represent what it looks like in the eyes of the end user. Because this all boils down to what we and how do we experience everything. Now, we are out there. Uh, the whole concept of mobility as a service is about asking, and I would argue, the biggest question of our times, both for economic growth, sustainable one, but also for our sustainability goals, and also the survival of cities in, in this growth area, era that we're on. And it's quite simple, and, and this is where you get to close your eyes if you want to, because it's quite individual, it's personal question. And it is, what would I hear today have to promise to each and every one of you that you would give up your car and at the same time of course give me the same money that comes with it if we can answer this one a lot of other things will also also follow we're established to do this and uh, and we have about 80 people out there uh, I think five of them are designers it's great to also I bug them every now and then and say look the car industry has what about a million of the world's most talented designers the five of you, you can definitely beat them we're out there at least by 2030 that we together with the whole ecosystem will take care of of one million of them so what does it take to compare with car ownership look if that if you dare to do uh, go up against this biggest rival of our times the private car ownership you have to love your opponent, so we're not out there to blame anyone. It's, it's a tough competition if we really have to win the hearts, not the minds of people. What does it take to really go up against the car ownership? And the answer is also quite simple. Everything else. There isn't a single mode out there, a single player out there, not even the Ubers, the public transport, none of them alone can actually compete against car ownership. But if you put all of them together, if we put public transportation, if we put the car shares, if we put the ride shares, the taxis, the uh, micro mobilities, the scooters, bikes, car rentals, all of them into one simple application, and not just that, a one simple subscription, 
uh, that you pay on a monthly basis and, and provide it to you like this. Could that do it? And even on a, on a further thing, and I've asked this to a, quite a lot of young people, is that, okay, what if I promise you a sort of a skeleton key to your city? Everything, every door opens to you. And about 20% of them go, yeah, that, that, would, that would be at the same level. And then I say to British people, uh, how about I give you the whole UK? Hop on any train, any taxi, any car club, anything that you can ever think of, it's all yours, go. And they go, wow, that's big. But you can't really do that, can you? That's obvious, it should be like that. But then I go further and say, hey, what would be a bigger dream? And let's remember, car is a dream. If we were rational, we wouldn't be buying cars, or if we would, it would be the cheapest versions of them, because that makes, I'm a transport engineer by, by background, and that would be the smartest thing to do. We don't. So we have to appeal to people's actual emotions. And what if I tell you, I'll give you the whole world? So don't think of this as just a trip planner. That's just a part of it, to help. You're not paying for a trip planner, but you are paying for getting you there. And now, I've done this everywhere around the world, even before setting up this company, and asked everywhere the same question. What would I have to promise? What would I have to promise? And it boils down to the same thing always. People get it. They would love to get a Netflix of transportation, what we're doing, like this. And they know, okay, it, it, uh, it's something that should be there. There shouldn't be rocket science. Uh, it boils down to, I need to be secured. Someone needs to promise my freedom, my individual freedom. It's a, it's a big sentiment, and that means anywhere, anytime, on a whim, just like that. In other words, what we need to be able to do is also another question that I tend to ask people, so what's your car like? Normally people raise their hands, I don't, now we're virtual. Then I ask, well, do you have your dream car? And outside of Abu Dhabi, not many hands are up. In Abu Dhabi, all the hands were up, of course. Instead of your car that is mediocre, but you're paying quite a lot, we can give you a garage. Actually, better cars, all of this. And the reason is, is also quite simple. We, we can do it because you're not using it. So, after the biggest task on Earth, uh, the company uh, that is doing this mobility as a service, the last part of it, actually selling packaging bundling to the end user, taking care of the UX on it, uh, was formed 2015. Uh, we have now, and, and sometimes those in the industry will ask this question, how on earth will you get partners to be involved? We've tackled that now. The, the offering is such that we have about 30 partners already integrated within the app, within the service, and about 80 that are actually waiting there. We have 16 million uh, trips worth of all the different modes that we now understand what it really takes, and revenues of 15 million that we've gathered to get some information. Uh, we've been able to gather so much 54 million uh, euros of funds, mostly from strategic ones that understand that this is the disruption and want to, want to be part of it. Our vision really is, and, and believe it or not, it's not an impossible task at all by 2030 that at least we with our partners will take care of one million cars in there. We'll replace it with something that they love more. Not the rational, but they really love it. Now, is this a big thing? At the moment, transport mobility is uh, responsible for 25% of all carbon emissions. By 2030, it is bound to be 40%. And, and this is just how it is. And just electrification alone or things, little improvements will not cut it. We have to do something, not just taking care of the trash, but also doing something on, on how much do we consume, how much do we pollute. At the moment also, within Europe, in most of the cities, 38% of people, and this is where it, it really is true, and hard for me to believe as also as, as a 40 plus man, 38% of, of people are waiting to have something to replace their cars, but they don't have, they're underserved, they don't have a good choice, so they're waiting for something like us there. That means alone in EU roads, uh, today we have 70 million cars that are waiting to be replaced. How big is this? If we are the mobility, not the mobile operator, at the moment about 20% of household costs uh, go into transportation. It's the second largest expenditure right after living. So if you want to compare it, it's about 10 times, the average revenue per user is about 10 times as the telecom. And the, the disruption in this industry is quite similar to what happened in the 80s to, to telecom then. You will have your mobility operators sometime in the future. 76% of this $10 trillion market now goes into an asset that is used about 4% of the time. There isn't a better chance 
for a productivity leap anywhere in the world at the moment. What we do, according to scenarios from, from OECD, alone the concept of what we're doing can save 18% out of this. And this compared to already quite sustainable futures. And there's actually quite more that we can do. Uh, we already have proven track record that, hey, when people skip and they start doing subscriptions instead of ownership, uh, they use three times more taxis and combining with public transportation. 42% of all the bike trips that we do actually is coupled with public transport. So this multimodality with servicing people, not trying to force them into pipes, is actually functioning. Even more so, we give the cities and governments a tool that they've been waiting for. Now, every city out there wants to say that we're banning diesels, we're banning cars two elections from now, because everybody understands it's not doable. You cannot take away people's idea of their individual freedom. What we are bringing in is something that they actually want, so that you can drive these types of policies to change the cities from congested, polluting cities into something that people actually like. But it doesn't happen until we are out there, until we are there to serve the people in a way that they want, because otherwise you have to do it the harsh way. How do we make money then? There is, of course, the, the reselling model, but the dream of people is that somebody promises. Remember, you need a promise to go anywhere, anytime, on a whim. When you go and buy your car, you're not thinking about your next ride, or not even the next week, you're thinking about a year ahead. And you need someone you can trust to take care of all your trips. Now, this is where it comes in. And the same with the cars. You're not really buying it with rational. You're paying for your individuality, your convenience, the capacity to use it whenever you need it. And this is what we make also. Average European uh, will pay 616 euros per month for their cars. Now, if we get you to pay the same amount for me, and all I have to do is take care of all your trips, I know you're going to do about 3.7 trips on average. I know the length of those trips. This is the trick. You're not going to do one trip more, because even if I give you unlimited taxi, you're not going to want to sit in the back seat of a taxi all the time. So this is what I'm getting. And then the second part is the production costs. And how do I make profits is if I turn even one taxi ride, which is the expensive kilometers, you walking, biking, using any of these cheap but sustainable modes. Changing this modal split wheel in this business model, even a little bit, 5% less taxis, 5% less of cars that we calculated before, and we can actually nudge people towards it, will mean 100 euros in profits to us if we say that we've decoupled the price element from the production cost. And this is actually real. So we're selling the same sentiment of freedom, but the production cost actually is better for us the more sustainable you are. Like I said, we're the ones uh, creating this co completely new product category. The opportunity is humongous. Uh, we've done it, we've started in, in Finland, which is a good sandbox for this. It's quite a sort of a nice small to get going. And we've proven there that we have about roughly 200,000 uh, customers in Helsinki that has inhabitants of about a million. Uh, we've done it also to show that it's doable in, in a number of countries, and which means that now we're ready for scaling. One nice incident to show about the resilience is that, of course, uh, people during the lockdowns have lowered their usage of public transport related subscriptions we have. We were able to recover and we have the uh, highest number of active users as we speak because they resorted to our bikes, our micromobility, our short term car usage. We have a, a so called, in a way, we have a, a p p possibility for them in any situation. So it means that the whole concept is extremely resilient. So what we're after, and the, what the world has not seen yet. It's easy to understand, and, and in the media we are called the Netflix of transportation, the Netflix of mobility. And yes, it is true. But just remember that the opportunity is multiplied by, by 10 or much more what people are actually willing to spend for it. There isn't a household name yet to combine and actually take care of a combination of mobility for you, someone to actually be your mobility operator. And this is where we are leading the pact, and we have all the chances to do that. As may be a summary of everything, so we are the category leader in a, in a really disruptive uh, concept that is about to change how we perceive mobility. And it will change also the face that the cities are run, because now they're, they're done with the private car ownership. We're leading this one. 
We've done 16 million trips already. We have the understanding with the partners how to do it on top of an ecosystem, which is the hardest part of all this, that you cannot dictate this kind of huge ecosystem. It has cities and everything in it. We have been able to define and prove the business model, how it functions, how to make money out of mobility, and how to make money by making people use sustainable choices. Our technology platform is one of the biggest implementation in, uh, in Amazon Web Services. We use about 16 million lines of code. So all the heavy lifting for this world of us being the, the Ubers, the public transport, the, the Limes, the Birds, the Six, the Hertz, and all of this in one application is done. We are ready for scaling now, and this is what we're doing. Now, um, what we are after at the moment for investors, we did our B round. And because of the corona situation, we're taking an extension to that before we actually go for the Series C and really conquer the world and give you a roaming mobility subscription that is global. Thank you. Thank you, Sampo. Yes, please, questions? Yes. Hello, so thank you so much for this presentation. Um, my first question will be, so you do have users, a lot of them, let's say in Finland, sold their cars. There's a, I can't tell you an exact number. And, and the reason is we're also quite European and maybe Nordic in this, that we only gather, we are there to serve our customers. We're not to spy on them. Uh, so we don't really ask them and we, don't, we try to gather as little information as possible. I know the trend is there. We're just trying to gather this. Out of the subscribers, we did a survey and about 60% of them said that they use us for all their trips. So that gives you a bit of an indication. Of, of how many of them have sold their cars. We tried to, like said, serve and not to spy. Because, because you said that 20% of um, household expenses are on transportation. So if people do not sell their cars, they still pay insurance, parking, and, uh, and actually the car itself, which means that they will increase their costs of transportation per family just like we do today with Uber. I use Uber and I increase the cost of transportation. There's always a risk in the beginning that you still hold on to the car as a sort of a safety measure, as an insurance. And for many, this is the case. And, and this will, it, it would be foolish for me to say, we come into a city and everybody will just sell their cars immediately. It's a, it, you need to take it step by step. First, we need to get them on showing that, hey, we have everything, you can rely on us. So, slowly they will start being, second car will be sold, and then for some the first car will be sold. Uh, of course, for some there's a, there's a risk that they are spending more. For industry, of course, what, what we are also after is holding on to the industry not becoming a utility. Let's remember it's a, it's a $10 trillion market. And if this becomes a utility, of course, then the ARPU will go down. And, and that could be quite disastrous for many, many economies itself. So what we're after is looking at it this way. If, if you spent that 616 euros per month, is hopefully we can offer you much more freedom with that. When you do need the car, it can be a better car. When you do need everything else, we have all of this for you. So we actually give you more. There will be some uh, who are about to spend more, of course. There are those that are saving in this. But altogether, on a, on a bigger, uh, bigger scale of things, uh, once, once we get that 600, once we liberate the money that you're spending in your car, that 616, I can give you a lot of different things. The good part of this is that it makes sense for us to make you do sustainable choices, as long as we decouple the price from production cost. Because sustainable trips are also cheap. And thank you so much. And my last question is, how, um, who are your clients? Your clients are physical individuals, um, like the number of global population, something like this. How, how, how do you see your revenues? 
Everybody tends to now, within the industry, go for that we want to enable mass, we want to do, we want to be in this ecosystem. Why I founded the company was because everybody wanted to just enable and nobody wanted to do. So we are out there to take care of the, the last mile, which is taking care of the actual consumer. In, in a way, you have to build something that the, that the people love before you can start doing anything else. So we are out there to make, us, make the service service individuals because this is what, what also car does. Now, of course, we have a, a product line which is proven to be really good and, and lucrative, which is uh, the, the companies, businesses, instead of company cars, they come to us and they say that, hey, could we give them a mobility, uh, mobility offering, a mobility subscription instead? And, and this has really surprised us because even before we had the business subscriptions, we had inbound companies coming and say, could you please, could you please? And, and the reasoning is also because we're an independent one. It's, it's hard for them to do uh, just one transportation provider's app, uh, whereas we gather everything and, and we include everything in it, so it's easier for them to give. So first you have to do, like the car, first you have to build something that people love. Then you can have different types of channels to sell it. So, so you contract with transportation industry, actually, not only with uh, individuals. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. In order to be able to provide this service, you contract you agree with um, transportation industry yes okay. we we contract uh, like in any city we are in a way the backbone of, of delivery is public transportation so that's what we need we need taxi like services to complement that because you know in a way we try to figure out that what how what would I have to have that I can take care of all your trips for at least a month and it means public transportation. It needs enough of taxi type of services to complement that. It needs definitely needs access to cars because people of Berlin or Paris or Tokyo probably will not have their cars because of the city. They have it to get out of the city. So we need to give them the, the thought that I can, I can go out and, and give them the access to cars. Nowadays also having access to bikes and micromobility seems to be uh, relevant. So with these four, we're good enough to be your mobility operator already and be quite uh, credible in, in providing all the trips for you. Thank you. Thank you, Sampo. <laughs> Moving on to our, our next presenter, I'd like to introduce Nick Hawker, CEO of First Light Fusion. Hello, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Nick, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Fusion Power. Um, get the slides working, hopefully. There we go. Um, so yes, this is, our, this is our mission statement. Solve the problem of Fusion Power with the simplest machine possible. And uh, I'm going to come back to this as I go through and explain what it is we do. And hopefully, you'll understand where I'm coming from, or where we're coming from with this being our mission statement. Um, first thing I want to say is that fusion is going to be solved, and it is going to be solved this decade, in my view. There are there is multiple there are multiple projects around the world, uh, four or five um, that are really incredible uh, physics um, uh, experiments aiming to show that crucial thing of more energy out uh, than in, so energy gain. Um, that's what's that's what's needed is to to solve that challenge, solve the physics problem this decade, to get a plant on the grid next decade to get 10 plants on the grid before 2050 to really make a difference to climate change. Um, so very quick history. So we span out from the University of Oxford in 2011. Since then, we've been through a few rounds of funding. Uh, we've been through um, <clears throat> a lot of growth and a lot of um, uh, different experiments. Uh, we're now um, uh, currently running our uh, fusion demonstrator. So we started with simulation work and the simulations theme is very strong in our, in our work uh, um, still to date um, and we now have our, 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 a crucial demonstration of the physics uh, which we're which we're very close to, to doing um, along the way we've been able to attract a very talented um, advisory board um, and I'm, I will I'll let you read that um, whilst I say that um, so that uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to talk first about the technology first more about the kind of the core fusion bit and then second about the, the power plant that that leads to um, and then at the end I'll say a bit about uh, the business proposal we have, the business plan that we have 
um, which is um, as much as the technology is unique, the business proposal is unique as well. Um, so on to uh, technology. Um, so in order to make fusion happen, you need uh, three things. Um, you need uh, temperature, density, and time. And um, what, what this means on kind of a, a microphysical level is the temperature is how fast the atoms are all moving. And they need to come together fast enough that they overcome the natural repulsion that wants to pull them, push them apart. And then they have that chance to, to fuse. So you take two types of hydrogen and they fuse and they form helium. Uh, and they release a lot of energy in that process. Um, density and time are then, are then related, but can kind of trade off. You need, the, you need them, the, the atoms to actually find each other and collide and hit. And then you need to have enough time for the reactions to progress. So these three things are so fundamental to uh, fusion that you actually can they are literally times together and it's called the triple product and it's the best measure of, of fusion performance. In terms of technology for fusion, there's, there's two main approaches. There's magnetic fusion and inertial fusion. Um, so magnetic fusion, it, it's, it's, it's like a furnace, basically. You build a big magnetic bottle which holds the plasma together and it's just always on, always hot, uh, putting out a steady flow of energy. Um, inertial fusion is very different, conceptually very different because it's a pulsed process. So it's like an internal combustion engine. You have to put the fuel in, you have to spark the fuel to burn. It burns and releases a very sudden pulse of energy. You have to capture that energy, you have to reset the machine and you have to do it again. Um, so what we are doing, what we're working on is a new method for inertial fusion, which we call projectile fusion. Um, and this is like, the, this is the simplest, stupidest diagram I can draw to, to explain it. Um, so basically what we do is we use electromagnetic launch. So basically it's like a, it's like a rail gun. Um, and what we do is we launch a um, projectile to a very high velocity, to a very high energy. And um, the projectile flies a short distance and it hits into a, a target. And um, inside the target, deep inside the target is uh, the fusion fuel. And the job of the target is to focus the energy of that projectile into the fusion fuel. And uh, we're, we're creating the same states of matter that everyone pursuing inertial fusion is creating, but we have a different system for, for creating it, which is important. You know, we're not trying to say we've got new physics here or something complicated like that. It's a, it's a different method for achieving the same thing. Um, here is a, an example, just a bit of eye candy on what that looks like. So this is one of our simulations. I don't know if it's playing very well on, on your screen, but um, uh, this shows what happens when that projectile uh, hits the hits the target. Uh, and this is the picture of the, the fusion experiment. So this is machine three. So um, uh, it's a, a large pulse power machine. Uh, the blue boxes, which I hope you can see. Yeah, I think it's come up now. The blue boxes are capacitors. So we charge the capacitors over 50 seconds and then we discharge them in two millionths of a second. And that launches the projectile, which then hits into the target. So the velocity is the key thing for us. That shows that's the kind of best KPI, uh, I suppose. And um, uh, this axis just shows you where we need to get to, uh, to get to certain uh, uh, points. So in order to get to fusion, we need to get to 50 kilometers per second. Now with machine three, we're, at, we're able to get to between 20 and 30 kilometers per second. So there's a, there's a crucial fact here, which is, is clearly missing in the story, which is that um, the target is extremely important. And, what the target does is it multiplies the velocity of the impact. So um, that simulation, which I just flashed up, um, uh, um, that's just the basic design. Uh, most of our work is on what we call advanced target designs. We keep it all as trade secret. And what they do is they multiply the velocity. And um, ultimately, that makes a massive difference to the projectile you need and the machine you need. And it's that which is really is the key to making the whole thing uh, work. Okay, so that probably didn't sound like the simplest machine possible, um, but let me talk about the, the power plant and the advantages that projectile fusion has. So why do we do projectile fusion? Well, one of the things that it gives you is space. Um, and with a bit more space, some of the very challenging engineering problems of fusion get a lot easier. So our power plant design avoids the, the three biggest challenges of fusion engineering, preventing neutral damage, producing tritium, managing extreme heat flux. More people have heard of the top one than the other, so I'm gonna talk about that one, preventing neutron damage. So basically what happens is you get this pulse of energy out, and most of the energy comes off in, in, in the form of neutrons. 
And the problem is that when the neutrons hit into any you know, structural steel, it weakens it and it makes it brittle. And eventually over time, that steel would fail. And you can't let that happen in a power plant. So what that means is that there's a replacement cycle for the key components right in the middle. And that's a big challenge because these are, these are components buried right in the very heart of the, the power plant. They are not easy to get to. Um, so with projectile fusion, what we can do, we can invert the normal paradigm. Instead of having a chamber wall and then a, a liquid coolant behind the wall taking the energy away, actually we can have the liquid coolant inside the chamber and the chamber wall is behind. And that means the neutrons, when they come out, they go into the liquid. And you can't destroy the crystal structure of a liquid and make it brittle over time. That was nonsensical. It was making sense. So um, this uh, basically uh, avoids the neutron damage uh, question completely. Um, that's very abstract. So this is a bit more kind of what it might actually look like. So basically, the idea is to, to leverage an existing approach, an existing technology from, from nuclear, uh, which is uh, a pool type liquid metal system. So basically, we have this big pool of liquid metal. And um, uh, the, the projectile will hit the target in vacuum just above the pool of, of liquid metal, and it releases this pulse of energy. And then the key thing here is that we, we pump the liquid metal out to the top of the reaction chamber, and we have it fall uh, coming in from the top, like a, like a liquid waterfall or liquid, liquid metal curtains. Um, and that's how we get the coolant in between the, uh, the fusion event and the chamber walls. Um, and uh, yeah, this is an example. This is a sketch of what uh, what that power plant leading from this uh, could look like. Um, and um, uh, the first of kind vision that we're working towards is basically uh, the simplest thing we can possibly do. I, I want one unknown process in my first of a kind power plant, and that's the fusion bit in the middle. Everything else, I want to absolutely minimize uh, risk. So uh, small plant size. Uh, is a huge uh, thing in minimizing the uh, engineering risk. So at 150 megawatts electrical, we can take a um, balance of plant from a concentrating solar plant and put it directly into our plant uh, without modification, almost, uh, which dramatically reduces the risk in the balance of plant. And then uh, uh, the other thing is um, operating at a slow frequency. So firing one shot every 30 seconds or so. Um, and that makes all of the Inertial fusion specific engineering challenges is much, much easier. Um, okay, uh, so onto the, the business side of things. Um, again, I, uh, simplicity, <laughs> simplest possible, is, is kind of the mantra here. So um, each target uh, will release the same amount of energy as a barrel of oil. Um, so, yeah, you can, um, you can pick your cliche. Um, uh, it's the ultimate razor blade, it's the ult ultimate uh, Nespresso capsule. Uh, so this is a consumables business where we manufacture and supply the targets to the operators of the power plant. Um, but unlike an espresso capsule, the targets keep getting better over time. Uh, they keep releasing more and more energy, or they cost less and less to make. So you, the economics of your plant actually improve as you, as you operate it and as you go through time. Um, for everything else, our strategy is partnership. And this is just an illustration to show that by showing the, the existing nuclear value chain. And um, if I swap this out for how we see the fusion value chain with our business model, uh, First Light is the, is the fuel provider. And yeah, now, right now, we have to be thinking about the power plant. We have to be you know, providing that vision and that leadership. Um, but ultimately, it's not critical to our business plan to actually own any intellectual property in the power plant. I mean, we're not, we're not daft. If we've got good ideas, we're going to patent them. But ultimately, that's the business opportunity for our partners. If you look at it in terms of levelized cost, actually the business opportunity for our partners uh, might be 10 times larger than our business opportunity. So there's a really strong motivation uh, for everyone to get involved here. Um, uh, so yeah, where are we at and uh, what's the plan? Um, so as I said, we're, we're operating Machine 3 now. Uh, that's our fusion demonstrator. Uh, we are fully funded to get through, uh, through that demonstration. And um, at the minute, we expect that we'll be uh, fundraising again um, uh, next year uh, at some point, uh, likely uh, to be uh, around about this time uh, next year. So um, uh, with that, I will uh, stop and um, any questions? Thank you very much.
Thank you for uh, another interesting presentation of a very different part uh, of, of, I guess, the, the stages of a company. Um, can I ask you, could you say something, what is the chemistry of the targets and projectiles that you use? And the second question is, how do you compare with General Fusion? They're doing something very similar and they've been in the business much longer. Yeah, um, so um, the, the targets and the materials and so on, um, uh, basically normal materials, normal engineering materials. So the projectiles that we launch at the moment are um, aluminium or copper or plastic. And the targets are made out of, um, again, similar normal materials. So there's, there's no new novel material which has to be invented to make this whole thing, whole thing work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the target materials are more expensive, and um, that is something which will need to be kind of optimized in future to try and minimize the amount of the expensive materials. Uh, but there's, there's no kind of supply you know, challenge or, or anything in, in any of the materials involved. Um, how do we compare to, to General Fusion? Um, General Fusion system superficially looks quite similar because it's a liquid metal. Um, um, but in one kind of key characteristic, it's, it's very different. So the fact that we're using this liquid metal thing, that has absolutely no impact on the actual fusion physics itself. It's fully decoupled. The projectile hitting the target happens in vacuum and on a, on a kind of a stupid level, there's no way that an atom of that metal can get into the fuel. And that's profoundly important because if an atom of that metal does get into the fuel, it's actually something that's called poisoning of the plasma. If it's not pure hydrogen, um, it has a very profound effect on the plasma physics. And in General Fusion's device, um, it's a very integrated device and it's very coupled. It's not to say that it can't, they can't find a way for it to work. They can, they might be able to find a way for it to work. Um, but if the plasma physics in the middle doesn't work, then you kind of, there's not really anywhere to go. Whereas if one of our target designs doesn't work, fine, well, we switch to one of the other target designs and the power plant concept remains, remains the same. So I think that's my answer basically. Is that, yeah, it, it does, I, I kind of, I understand why it looks similar, but there's a decoupling in our technology, which, which uh, is, is very important. And uh, could we add Pulsar fusion to that too? You're, how do you differentiate yourselves from Pulsar? Um, I don't know very much about Pulsar fusion. Um, I know that they are looking at um, uh, a tokamak and um, the uh, level of physics proof that a tokamak can work um, is, uh, is uh, high, uh, uh, but not complete, but high. Um, the level of proof for inertial fusion generally is equally high, uh, but we have to demonstrate that our new method really does actually create those same states of matter, so we need to prove more. Um, then equally, the, the um, engineering challenges of a tokamak are also very well understood, and they are extremely, extremely difficult. Um, so um, I suppose that's a quite a general compare and contrast between um, us and, and tokamaks in general. Um, there's a number of companies working on tokamaks, um, and, and yeah, Pulsar, are, Pulsar are one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Can, you. can you run us through a bit more on the timelines in the coming years? Obviously, you have commercialization being, being further away. What are the next milestones for you? Uh, well, the, ne the next big milestone for us is to actually measure f evidence of fusion in the real world um, and soon. Um, you know, like I said, we've, the experiment is operating, um, and, we're, and we're, we're doing that, doing that work now. Um, the next stage is, um, has two objectives, although one is clearly the more I, in my views, is, is the more important. Um, so it's uh, to build a gain experiment. So we'll need a new round of funding to build a bigger machine to get to higher projectile velocities in order to demonstrate more energy out than in. And I'll, to make that really tangible, the goal specifically we're going to be aiming for there is that the fusion energy release is 10 times greater than the energy of the projectile. Uh, so that's a, a quite specific definition. And exactly what you'd need for a functioning power plant is not quite exactly that we can go but that's that the reason that's the goal is that's the, the threshold that we feel proves the physics once and for all um, and the second thing we're going to be doing is getting to the point of having a conceptual design for a power plant um, and uh, we will be uh, working to de-risk as much of that as possible 
uh, alongside the gain experiment. So a lot of the power plant, if you looked at it, the power plant in terms of the, the total cost, um, um, probably 80% of it is at TRL9. It's fully developed technology that we're borrowing from somewhere else. Um, there are some specific subcomponents which are at lower TRL, and there's a range between, you know, first kind of benchtop experiments to actually medium-sized prototypes have already been built. So we would like to try to get all of those supporting technologies to TRL six, which basically means, in my in my definitions anyway, um, a, a full-scale subcomponent test. So you do it with the full reactor scale uh, uh, subsystem. Uh, but not integrated with the whole, you know, it's a, it's a bespoke isolated test to see if that subsystem works. And um, uh, if we do those two things together, then uh, I think we'll be going straight into a first of a kind uh, project. And I think um, um, we would be looking to try and build a plant which is, yes, it's a pilot and it's a technology test bed, but uh, with a design where once you get through that phase of testing all the subcomponents together and a very slow commissioning process, ultimately is actually an energy generation asset. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the, those are the timelines. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, the aim is to, the, um, the uh, gain experiment we think is a, is a five-year effort. Okay. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you for, thank you for joining us and explaining everything. My pleasure. Next up, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Tashir Tucker, CEO of Alumbia, to the stage. Very good. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tashia Tucker. I'm the CEO and founder of Alumbria. We are an agricultural tech company based in London. Uh, we got founded back in 2017, originally a spin-out project from the Royal College of Arts and Imperial College in London. Um, so by now, I think we've all heard the problems that honeybees are having, keeping up with the pollination demand of some of our most important and critical crops. You add to that the fact that bumblebees are starting to become extinct. Over the last 25 years, we've had more than a 75% decline in insects overall. Put on top of that, the devastating impacts of climate change and predicting the bloom season, blooms coming in early or late, depending on the weather. And we can even start to stretch and think as far as the recent wildfires that we've seen. So it's property damage and damage to people, but that's also natural habitats for our insects to live and, and to thrive. So altogether, that's causing a, a devastating impact on food security for the future. So you can think about avocados, mangoes, tomatoes, berries, all of these things are under serious threat without insects contributing to them. So if we just take one case study, for example, if we look at the US, in February, almost every single commercial beehive in the country gets on the back of a truck, drives out to California for the almond bloom, stays there for about three or four weeks. Those bees get packed up, moved on to cherries, packed back up again, moved on to citrus, again to berries. So at the end of the season, at the end of the year, colonies are almost completely devastated. Beekeepers are seeing 40 to 50% loss in their hives. So one, it's pesticides that are killing them, parasites that are killing them, but then also our natural process of how we're doing pollination right now. It's quite devastating. If we take a look at the average cost of beehives for a farmer, so that cost has gone up five-fold over the last eight years, let alone the kind of impact of availability of hives, the cost is increasing. You add to that the fact that we're planting five times as many pollinator-dependent plants. You can think about all the almond milk we love to drink. We keep planting more and more crop acreage of these plants depending on these insects without any real kind of understanding of how we're going to support the pollination moving forward. So overall, just in purchasing beehives and hand pollination, which is a whole nother kind of area, um, it's a four billion pound market in which farmers are having to endure. Hand pollination is quite interesting as well because in areas where you don't have the pollinators available, it means someone is literally standing on a ladder with a paintbrush going from bloom to bloom and hand pollinating the plant. It sounds very restful and zenful for about an hour, but then you can imagine that that's a quite a tedious job to have. So, you know, I think moving forward, we know that there's a multitude of insects that are out there that are doing the job. 
they just tend to get a little less credit. They're the, the underdogs of the pollination community. One in particular is the humble hoverfly. So hoverflies already do about 30% of the world's pollination. Um, the problem is, is they get distracted. They're not as efficient as bees are. So they'll wander off onto another crop and to give farmers that exact kind of precision pollination that they need, um, we've developed a system that starts to encourage them to be better pollinators. So it's a closed loop system. The first part, we provide data to a farmer, data that a farmer has never had access to before. So this is the quantity and count and location of pollinators throughout a field. We've then developed a natural uh, proprietary uh, chemical release system that allures the hoverflies to the area and encourages them to pollinate and forage on the crop. These are organic, natural chemicals that we use. And then we have our hoverflies that we start to release. So all of this is controlled through a single user interface for the farmer. So as one section of their bloom starts to come in as opposed to another, you can target your pollinators specifically where you need them at that time. So you could develop a system where you're simply just releasing hoverflies without technology and without chemicals. Um, but again, you don't have that increased yield at harvest time for the grower. And we're not getting that sort of information. Right now, the data that we have on pollination is an entomologist that stands and stares at a one meter by one meter area with a clipboard and manually counts how many bees, how many flies, how many bumblebees they see. So this is automating that process. And it also becomes a proving point for us. So we get to have a kind of analysis of what your pollinators were doing before you've implemented our system. And we have a very kind of data-driven uh, analysis as to what's happening after. So from a farming perspective, it's kind of threefold the benefit that they give. Um, you have that optimized pollinization at the end of the bloom season. If we look at blueberries, for example, without having enough pollinization, you have two seeds that get set in the fruit versus 23 seeds that get set in the fruit. So it makes a denser, more delicious fruit. It extends the kind of harvest period that a farmer can go out to market. Um, they have this kind of more marketable fruit as well, so not sending their produce to a frozen production, not using chemical sprays to artificially pollinate the plant, um, and really gets them that value at the market when they start to deliver. And then it's that added benefit of being able to maximize their existing poll pollination services. The fact that when you ask an average farmer, how do you know how many hives to put out per acre, it's always just a guess. You know, my parents have done this or my grandparents have done this for generations and that's what we do, but that's as much information as they know. So being able to target and pinpoint this data, you can then understand the better placement for your hives, how many hives you actually need, um, and start to get a more complete picture of your pollinators. So um, from a profit perspective, it's a very small input that a farmer needs to do to increase this poll pollination um, in order to really drive that par profit margin for them. Um, so we have a breakdown here of kind of without a pollination system and then with a pollin pollination system is that increase in tonnage at the end of the year per acre at their harvest time. From a company standpoint, it's farming as a service. So we have basically have mimicked the existing beehive rental service that farmers are already comfortable with. Three season contracts, similar to what they're doing to their pollination service per acre per bloom season, which allows us to capitalize on multiple different crops per bloom season. We can go out to almonds, pack up our devices, charge them, update software, send them out to cherries, do the same thing to berries, except for we're not driving around with live bees on the back of our truck. Um, our hoverflies simply get delivered as pupae. So in a small jar about this size, you can have 200 fly pupae that are ready to go when you need them. Uh, so for the team, um, my family has a background in farming, so for generations have been doing uh, farming throughout the U.S. We have our behavioral entomologist, our, engineer, our engineering team, hardware developing team. Um, we have Phil, who's our kind of strategic tech advisor. He's a former COO at AT&T. Uh, and then we have an amazing group of consultants that work at the University of Greenwich Natural Resources Institute. So these are entomologists, behavioral ecologists, and chemical entomologists uh, that have been working in this field and specifically with hoverflies for decades now. And you know, for us, it's really about being able to ground that in an incredible advisory board. So these are professionals that are, you know, top of their field. Erica McAllister, for example, is a senior diptera curator at the Natural History Museum in London. 
There are over 6,000 species of hoverflies. About 200 of those are native throughout Europe. So finding the right hoverflies that are going to pollinate, increase that yield for you is quite critical. So having backing from experts who've been working in this and understand all the different species and all the different possibilities within that is quite critical. And then having our farming advisory board too. Um, so as far as traction, we're kind of at the stage now where you know, the first year was really about understanding farming. We went out and, and, and really talked to farmers about what their pollination needs are, how they actually work on a farm. I think we were a bit naive when we first went out to farmers and thinking that there were going to be tons of drone technology everywhere and they would have billions of apps on their phones, but we realized that that wasn't necessarily the case. So being able to keep it as simplistic as possible, so getting our feet on the ground, really working hand in hand with the farmers those first year was quite critical for us. Um, from then we expanded into lab trials and outdoor field trials. All of this was run with the um, University of Greenwich and NIAB EMR. Um, and really we're at the point now where we're starting to scale those trials. So we have a partnership with Driscoll's Berries. They uh, control one third of the six billion pound berry market. They're one of the largest berry cooperatives in the world um, and provides us access to farmers throughout Europe and the US in particular, which is our kind of key, uh, key areas that we're working in now. Specifically, we've been focusing in berries and strawberries in particular, moving from an indoor context from truly glass houses to covered crops inside of polytunnels and then moving into larger scale outdoor growing as well. Um, so as far as competition in the space, it's a really kind of interesting space that's coming up with, with pollination. You have your kind of fly-in-a-box companies that are doing, just as I described earlier, raising hoverflies, distributing them to farmers, but that's, that's really the, the kind of system that they have is just providing the hoverflies. You have drone bee technology. You'll see large companies like Walmart purchasing patents for robotic bees. If anyone has seen Black Mirror on Netflix, you can learn about the kind of devastating effects that robotic bees can have. Um, but it's expensive to implement. It's, you know, it's not as effective as using natural pollinators in the world. Um, and you have pest detection companies that are solely focusing on AI and machine learning for pests in particular, but not, not so much on pollination. Um, and then you have new aerial pollination companies that are coming out. So basically blowing live pollen onto the plant which is really great for wind pollinated crops, but there's only a small select group of crops that are solely dependent on wind pollination without insects. So it doesn't start to work in that sort of system. And then again, you're missing out on the data component of it. You're missing out on the precision and being able to target that pollination when you need it. Um, so there's challenges within that space. And you know, there's a, a whole group of companies that are focusing on beehive technology, which is quite critical. We need bees and we need them to do well, we need them to be healthy, um, but we also need to understand that there, there's a wide range of insects that we can start to look at as well. So um, over the last couple of years, I think I was mentioning that we've gone through our kind of trials and proof of concept, our outdoor and lab trials. We raised an initial amount of funding um, that really got us off the ground, got us the corporate partnerships that we're working with now, um, and really uh, pushing for that scale in the next bloom season starting in the spring. So currently we're raising our seed round of funding, uh, 1.5 million. Uh, we have 1 million of that already committed into the round. And that really gets us to the point where we start to scale this production. So that carries us for the next two bloom seasons. It gets us out to larger scale farmers, generating revenue really in close contact as we start to grow. Um, from then, we start to expand into other market areas. So almonds, of course, is a huge market area. Farmers are paying the highest price for hives right now and have the greatest amount of struggle. So moving into bit from berries into almonds is quite key for us. It's nice to be in berries right now because your average strawberry grower also is growing raspberries, blackberries, blueberries. So we can cover a wider range of crops by going into the berry market first and then expanding into the nut market. Um, so we've just had some really great kind of um, support as we've come along the way. I guess two most notably will be the Thrive Ag Tech Accelerator that's based in uh, Salinas, California. 
Um, you know, they've really uh, given us our kind of roots and foundation in agriculture, have an extensive amount of partners to start to work in the space, have helped us coordinate this relationship with Driscoll's, um, and have been great investors and partners to have on board. Um, we also have Innovation RCA, so they really gave us our start when this was just a school project and a good idea years ago. Um, really gave us our kind of founding and, and backing from a business standpoint of how to get set up and what we needed to do. So I think overall the main point that we are trying to drive home is we want to develop a sustainable pollination system, a diverse pollination system that secures our, our food and our kind of livelihood for the future. So basically it's pollination without the sting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. Any questions from the audience for now? Yes, please come up. Hello, and thank you Hi. for your uh, lovely presentation. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if by introducing so many of this type of insect into the natural environment, if you're not just beginning to play perhaps negatively with the natural balance of things. Yeah, I mean, I think when we start to look at that number of a 75% decline over the last 25 years, the, the hoverflies that we introduce are not even able to get it to the level of which we already had naturally out in the world. Right now, we artificially rear bumblebees by sticking them in storage containers over winter and feeding them fake pollen to get them to go out to the field. There's also over 60 different insects that are commercially reared for agriculture. You can think about ladybugs that eat aphids, lace wingworms. You know, these, these are mites that we release out into the field. It's a common practice and established practice of using natural insects to kind of uh, combat what's happening in the environment. The nice thing about the hoverflies that we use um, is that they're aphidophagous hoverflies. That means at the larval stage, they eat aphids, which is a terrible kind of pest for farmers. Um, so it's nice that we get a dual purpose of being a natural biopest control and also replenishing the numbers of insects that are out there while also increasing the harvest for farmers. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just in terms of your timeline, your development as a company, when do you see yourself being a fully functioning company and up and running? Yeah, well, we're right on the brink of that. With this, this spring that's coming up, we have a great group of growers for paid pilots. Um, you know, and that's really pushing our kind of scaling and production from our trials that we've done over the last few years. Um, so the next two bloom seasons, so 20, 21, and 22, are really working with this group of berry growers in a pilot kind of format and then scaling uh, to a much larger field from there. Thank you. Can you go into a little bit, uh, please, about the, the innovation in the, the attractant and with the flies? And which ones are more important? Are they both important and, and the differences there? Yeah, I think if you were to just release, well, I think first, with those 6,000 species of hoverflies that are available, there's only three that are commercially reared and available currently. Um, and we've done tests and trials with all the commercially available flies, compared those to wild flies that we are rearing ourselves that have never been commercially reared before, and did an analysis of that kind of combination between solely releasing the flies without the lure and then releasing the flies with the lure. In our last outdoor field trial, we were able to achieve nearly a 20% increase in strawberry weight. We had a slight increase in sweetness, a slight increase in firmness, but the main marker was the overall weight of the strawberry. You can imagine on the outside of the strawberry, each of those individual seeds that you see in the fruit need to be set by an insect. So there's a very kind of visual correlation between pollination and the kind of final fruit that you get at the end. So using the lures, you know, really targets them and increases that effectiveness of the hoverfly out in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasha. Thank you. So next up, uh, I'd like to introduce Michael Goldstein, chairman of Raycatch. Bonjour, everybody. 
Thank you for the opportunity for presenting Raycatch at Clean Equity 2020 Monaco. My name is uh, Mike Goldstein. What Raycatch is doing, we are using software to make the lives of solar operators and owners easier. And we allow solar operation to be adopted easier and cheaper and globally and we also increase the asset profitability while the IOR of those assets are going down. So in general we're trying to make solar more feasible uh, all over the world. Solar assets are considered to be a fixed income asset, very similar to real estate. But there's a very big difference between real estate and solar assets. Whereas real estate is predictable, we've been having assets for many years and they're very stable. Solar assets are young, it's, only, it's an industry of 15 years old and there are millions of electronic parts in those assets and basically everything can go wrong. So that's one major difference on fixed income between real estate and solar assets. If we look on other industrial facilities like gas turbines, power plants, and those plants actually there's one engine with 1000 sensors attached to it. So the capability to understand what's going on if you have those sensors and everybody has those sensors is quite straightforward. Whereas in a PV asset, in order to keep the operation and the cost cheaper, uh, there are much more panels or engines than sensors. So the data ratio is the opposite. So you have millions of components in a big PV plant and you don't have relatively a lot of data to figure out what's happening inside those assets. Few words about the company. We are five years old. We have 25 employees spread in Europe and in Israel. Our R&D facilities are in Tel Aviv, in Slovenia, and also in Palestine, working with our neighbors, promoting peace locally. Uh, we have been operating on four gigawatts on uh, global assets. We receive investment from European companies such as Royal DSM, Baywa in Germany and Phoenix Contact in Germany as well. Total investments to date are $8 million. This is a snapshot of some of the clients we're working in. Uh, most of them are global with uh, multinational operations with the challenge of having one headquarters with the need to understand and to operate efficiently and smoothly all their assets. Let's dive deep into the requirements of, man of management assets. So today there are manual techniques where people are sitting in a control room using formulas, using excels, using monitoring systems and trying to do interpretation over those assets. If you look on this graph here, this graph represents what we call PR, performance ratio, which is actually some kind of a grade how well the asset is performing. And from this uh, report in Germany, we see that assets do not behave the same. The challenge is to bring all those assets to the best performing point and doing that at the minimum budget. So in general then there's a need for automation and that's because the IOR or the returns for investment went down from 15 80% down to 6 8%. People or owners want to handle and own more assets but not increase their stuff doing that. So there's a major need for office automation. 
the SCADA systems of the monitor systems that provide the data are limited, and we need data and accurate data and insights to understand what are happening in those assets. What we are offering is actually a new software layer, what we call digital technical asset management, that allows operators to be more proactive, more precise, and to base their correction activities and decisions in general based on ROI. Some typical examples of things we're able to generate automatically, uh, those are relevant more to people who are familiar with the PV industry, but indications on the true PR and PRSTC, what is the exact irradiance? You know, solar plants are based on irradiance and you want to measure the radiance in order to estimate how good the assets are performing. Availability, temperature are the trackers, the mechanical trackers that track the sun working optimally. Um, wiring issues, inverter issues, grid issues. That's a typical assortment of problems that affect TV assets and our software are able to automatically detect all of them using AI and mathematical techniques applied on the data coming from those assets. The data coming from those assets are, is not perfect. And there are several reasons for that. And the main one is that owners and developers want to keep price low. So we don't have a sensor per panel or model. Uh, we have less than that. And those sensors are low cost, like five to 7% accuracy. However, we want to have insights and to gain understanding at accuracy of half a percent. Furthermore, that data, those data points are coming from the plants. So there's communication issues. And sometimes, or in many cases, the data is not complete, jumps in the data um, and time shifts and some other problems. Furthermore, if you look on the asset, many things are changing uh, simultaneously, like clouds moving, changes in the, in the radiation in the sun, dust accumulating. The plant looks passive, but it's a very active organism uh, with many signals. So there's a confluence of those variables and we need to separate those variables and especially to separate the environment factors because you really want to understand how the asset is performing by itself while taking the environment or the radiation or the temperature out from the equation. So our software is actually a SaaS software as a service solution. There's a subscription and then we start collecting data automatically. There is no installation of hardware on those PV assets. We actually don't even visit those assets. Everything is done from the cloud, Amazon cloud in our case. Um, we start taking on the data from the asset. The system goes with an AI process of understanding what are the problems in the asset or portfolio and start generating on a daily basis insights and action item that allow owners to improve their performances. Why do we need better accuracy? I apologize for diving into some technical uh, zoom, uh, but uh, it's important to understand. If we take the typical monitoring system, if you follow the red line here, uh, that's a typical monitoring system sensitivity, seven to 10 to 10 to 15%. Our aim is to be as sensitive as half a percent. So we are able to detect problems like escalating problems that start at a very early stage and to, cap, to catch them right on before they accumulate such an energy loss and before uh, those problems uh, get fade, faded away in other problems. And another case is small problems happening all the time 
which are running continuously, not necessarily escalating, that are below the monitoring sensitivity. So those are two types of defects. One is escalating, the other one is random and small. Both of them, or detecting both of them on time, translates into better performance of the asset. Furthermore, if you look on the signals coming from the monitoring system here on the right side, you see that it's quite noisy, confusing, and you don't have a clear-cut understanding of what's happening there. Obviously, some of them are performing better than the others. In this case, those are strings of models, but still the verdict is not clear. With our mathematical process and AI systems, we're able to clean the data and determine that this string is degrading normally, while this string here, the green one, is degrading uh, faster than that. While this string here has been degrading and then a sudden event happened, and those kind of patterns, those kind of behaviors, allows us to provide root cause analysis for our clients. The financial benefit of our system is both ways. We increase the revenues from the asset while using the same budget. So we don't ask our clients to allocate more budget, but simply use the same budget that you have and direct it to the points that the system recommends. So on average, you are able to generate 2% more revenues from that asset. And the bottom line is that you're also saving expenses because no more false technician visits, uh, everything is prioritized according to the impact. So the bottom line that we're able to save 10% of the operational costs at the headquarters. So that translates on this typical example, a reduction from 20 to 18%. So overall, an increase of 21% of the EBITDA just by using this software and following its recommendations. The software generates recommendations and action items and everything is according to priorities, things that are easy fix, which we call immediate, versus things that uh, require more effort, uh, long term, and everything is uh, sorted out according to uh, what you are able to do at your uh, immediate uh, plans. We have many case studies. Uh, we started in Europe, Taiwan, India, Japan, and other places, and the variety of uh, defects and problems that we allocate is really diverse from problems in the models, the panels, inverters, cables, Irradiation sensors, when to clean the panels, when to cut the grass, is there a problem with the grid, is the reading and the invoicing that you uh, do with the grid, is it correct or there's a systematic problem there? And the whole idea is to provide insights which are accurate as of, as of half a percent, uh, which allows the whole industry globally to operate more efficiently and actually allows to duplicate the expertise needed in places where those kind of experts cannot be found easily. So we believe this is key to make the PV more efficient, to spread out more wider than it is today and um, to actually allow it to maintain its uh, status as the leading clean source of energy. Thank you for listening and we are happy to receive any questions that you have. Thank you, Michael. First question coming up. Sorry, asking questions again. Uh, very interesting, and, and, and thank you for your patient presentation. Can you say something about who do you see as your uh, closest competitors, and why are you better than they? 
because there are multiple solutions that are being offered, maybe not exactly the same, but they solve the same kind of problem. And how do you differentiate yourself? Yeah, the natural, natural uh, suppliers of such a solution are coming from the SCADA and monitoring systems. Our approach is that we are uh, agnostic to the SCADA system. We ride on top of, exi of any existing hardware uh, and communication network in the field. And the idea is not dependent on a specific uh, vendor. So it's an extra layer on top of any SCADA system. And that's, what's, that's one of the things that makes us unique. Okay, thank you. I can, go into, I can, I can be so, more, I can yeah. go into details regarding names, but that's the, the borderline between uh, what makes us uh, separate from the others. And we believe that uh, since we, are the, we were the first one to introduce AI to this uh, industry, we believe that uh, we are maintaining our uh, leadership, at least in terms of uh, technology. Right, because where are you currently in terms of deployment, sales, established installations? Uh, we have four gigawatts uh, running under our system already. How much revenue is roughly does that correspond to? Uh, we cannot disclose revenues, but four gigawatts is quite a lot and it's been growing considerably the last year. Thank you. What is the focus then for the next 18 months? What is it that you're looking for? Is it just to expand um, on the sales side and, and on gigawatts? What is it that, that you need in those next 18 or so in months? All directions, both uh, deployment in other countries, the increasing our portfolio uh, of uh, more clients, especially major PPAs, IPPs, and private equity, uh, expanding also to uh, storage combined with PV, which has its own technical challenges in terms of uh, deploying AI. Um, that's it. That's enough on the plate. Are there any other sectors that this is applicable to um, beyond PV? Uh, naturally, it can be applied also to wind, but PV is such a large opportunity, uh, PV and energy combined, that that's our main focus for the next two years. So it's a PV and PV with storage combined. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, very, very, very thank you to, for joining us, um, uh, for explaining through. And I think that wraps up, unless there's any other questions from the audience here. No, so thank you very much. You very much. Uh, we have a short break here in Monaco, uh, and we are back at 15.15. Uh, Monaco time uh, with the Covington policy outlook, EU and US decarbonizing strategies. So we shall see you then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.